Good evening. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Board of Education. Um, the board uh, started its work this evening in closed session at about 550 um, for the purpose of discussion of employment of employee. Collective negotiations was also a posted agenda item. We did not have any conversation on that topic. Um, Mrs. Welsh, will you please call the roll? Mr. Carlquist? Here. Mr. Collins? Here. Ms. Conroy? Here. Mrs. Davey? Present. Mrs. Gironi? Here. Ms. Hirsch? Here. Mrs. Ostajic? Here. Seven board members present, none are absent. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you and uh, welcome to all uh, that have joined us this evening. Um, we have three individuals who have signed up uh, for public comment. Um, I'll, when I call your name, if you could come up to the microphone and start with your name and address. And please limit your comments to three minutes. There's a light up there that will help you keep track of that. And when the light turns red, uh, your three minutes is up. So um, we will start this evening with Bill Riddle. Good evening, I'm Bill Riddle, uh, 134 Caroline here in Elmhurst, and um, I'm the Performing Arts Department Chair at York High School. Although EPA process has at times been a difficult one, I also feel it's been the catalyst, uh, the catalyst in bringing our teachers in the music department throughout our district together to discuss our current program as well as possibilities for the future. I'd like to bring your attention to several items in our level spending plan that I believe can make a significant difference in the music education of all our students, all our music students district-wide. Um, by re reallocating funds in our current budget, we'd like to be able to create stipends for additional before-school choral directors at Bryan Middle School and Sandbird Middle School. Currently, both of these choirs that meet before school have well over 100 students with just one director. We'd also like to create a stipend for additional before for an additional before school band director stipend at Bryan Middle School to address the increasing band population which currently stands at close to 100 students. We'd also like to redistribute funds from the high school budget to the middle schools and elementary schools, I should say the high school music budget, in the areas of supplies, which includes the purchase of music, repair, and maintenance, capital purchases, which would be purchases of instruments or uniforms, large ticket items, and purchase services, which is bringing in specialists, which we, are, which we do at the high school in the brass and percussion and string and woodwind uh, specialists who, who work with our students. I'm aware that in, in this time of program evaluation and budget examination that it's unrealistic for us to expect that the music program can avoid some sort of reduction. However, the difference between absorbing a catastrophic 10% cut, which would amount to cutting approximately $135,000 of our current budget for supplies, repairs, new instruments, et cetera, the difference between that and making a lesser reduction that gives us the opportunity to continue offering the same level of quality programs that we are currently able to offer, as well as the opportunity for us to address some of these critical needs in our district, I believe that difference is quite significant indeed. I, I urge you to take a close look at our evaluation and the specifics of our plan and our vision for the future of the music students in District 205. Thank you for your time and allowing me to speak this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Elizabeth dirk -Seide. Good evening. Um, I have two or three hopefully quick things, didn't time this out, kind of scratching. Um, one, uh, I don't, not sure how much time you all get to spend in your middle schools. I know a few of you have children uh, who run into mine in the hallways. Um, I have a privilege to spend a lot of time at Churchville Middle School for the past five years, or maybe six. Um, get to know the staff and their responsibilities. The, what they cover. Um, 
I, I see on a list about administrative cuts an assistant principal at middle school. Um, I know our assistant principal uh, manages a lot. She manages all the discipline. She directs and coordinates all the special ed work, IEPs, 504s. She manages all the student scheduling, all the athletics, all the facilities, the Elmhurst Park District scheduling, the gyms, plays, concerts. She evaluates teachers and paraprofessionals and administrative staff, leaving time for the principal to take on these new instructional roles that we expect our principals to be able to uh, lead in the buildings. She is not expendable. I can't speak for the folks at Bryan and Sandberg. I assume that they have similar roles. Um, so I'd like to speak on behalf of the assistant principal position. Also, I was concerned today when I realized as I was listening to last week's board meeting and, and sort of guide, going through some of the materials to see that middle school guidance, the entire program, is being cut. This is core curriculum. This is curriculum akin to Reading Street, Springboard, Everyday Math. Um, children are working today in seventh grade, I know, on naming emotions and the triggers of emotions coping strategies, how to deal with peer pressure, changing fa family relationships for young adolescents and self-esteem, recognizing their strengths and weaknesses. This is much more than character counts, which is not an education instruction program. This is scenario-based, how do you deal with peer pressure? My daughter tonight, my seventh grader said, Mom, that's practically the only guidance we ever get. She doesn't really enjoy guidance, but she gets what it's for, and the instruction is critical. University of Chicago research out just last week talks about students who take part in SEL programming improve in grades and standardized test scores by 11 percentile points compared with non-participating students. Such improvement falls within the range of effectiveness for interventions focused solely on academics. Compared with their peers, participating students improve significantly on non-academic measures, social skills, less ac emotional stress, better attitudes, fewer conduct problems such as bullying and suspensions. For this study, researchers distinguish SEL intended to teach social skills broadly as opposed to bullying prevention. This is very important work. I will send you the research if you're interested. Um, music similarly builds brain matter Mrs. and brain Dirk growth. Zeddy, I'm, I'm sorry, you. you're going to have to sorry. rip it up. Our last speaker is Mike Pavlik. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Mike Pavlik. I'm director of bands at York High School and also live here in town, um, 818 South Hillside. And um, I just... Uh, was informed of the uh, decision of the board to to cut the reduction from 10 percent to 5 percent for the music and um, I, I just wanted I was uh, I'm, I'm thrilled by that decision and um, uh, I wanted I had prepared something here and so I will try to abbreviate a little bit from from what I've written but um, like Bill was saying I was, I was honestly uh, welcomed the opportunity to come together as a music faculty to discuss a honing of the district-wide vision for music education in District 205. And, and that conversation began with looking back at an extraordinary and humbling musical accomplishments over the past several decades that District 205 has enjoyed in music and provided an opportunity to celebrate what's been right and what continues to be right about music education in the district. However, just as in music, there is not just one right answer, and the job of a musician or an artist is to always be questioning and looking for that next best right answer. And in asking those questions, it soon became apparent that we needed to address the distribution of funding across the district. And EPIRT process or no EPIRT process, we came to a consensus about what the next best right answer is for the future of music education in District 205. Our better right answer shifts money from the high school, as, as Bill was saying, to the middle school and primary levels that will enable the needed enhancements in, in order to enrich the fine music that's already happening at those levels without compromising the high school's level of achievement. 
and the result of just planning these changes has already made noticeable differences in the sense of community that is present between the music educators and the district. And you can really sense that at the last in-service on Friday when the music teachers were able to get together at the end of the day. Um, the sense of trust and the level of camaraderie between us was, was different. And, I, you know, if just, if, if just planning that um, kind of vision uh, changes that uh, mood and that climate like that, I can't imagine with um, being able to implement some of those ideas. And I think certainly with the 5% reduction, we could still certainly, you know, address some of those issues. And um, I, I can't imagine, again, the remarkable difference, the differences that's going to make for our kids. So I'm, I'm thrilled by uh, that decision. And um, I think that's about it. Thanks for your time. Um, thank you very much uh, to all of our speakers, and uh, we have continued to receive uh, input via email, so we appreciate everybody who takes the opportunity to share their thoughts and input with us. Um, we are going to move forward on our agenda. Our first item under superintendent's communication is a uh, continuing discussion on the request from the Village of Bensonville to extend the TIF. And I'm going to turn this discussion over to Ms. Masterton, who will also introduce this evening um, representatives from the village, um, the, sit, the village of Bensonville, who are here to um, answer any questions or engage in any dialogue with the Board of Education with regards to this um, TIF extension that the uh, village of Bensonville is looking at. Ms. Masterton. Thank you, Dr. Krizik. Um, we've received additional information, and we've also asked Mr. Cassidy from Bensonville, um, and if you want to just raise your hand, there he is. Um, and maybe if you'd want to come up there, because I'm sure there's going to be some questions, um, to discuss the, the uh, Grand Avenue right up at the podium. Uh, she sure can, <laughs> absolutely. And you might want to introduce her as well. <laughs> um, the Grand Avenue and County Line um, Road um, TIF that we've been talking about that includes um, Country Inn and Suites right now and the former Legends area, and it's the former Legends area that it is in question on this. Um, we've got additional, and I put it over, but we actually, uh, Ms. Sullivan was kind enough to, Dr. Sullivan was kind enough to put um, some information over to you about the surplus distribution that we'd be looking at. Um, there is a time constraint based on the fact that the company that may be interested in this property is looking at other properties, and we and um, Bensonville would need to get down to the state board of education, not state board of education, it's to the legislature to. Um, to get this on their docket. And so they're planning on going next week uh, down to Springfield. And so they're hoping to get um, either a signed intergovernmental agreement or at the very least a letter uh, of agreement um, to take down with them. So I'm going to turn this over to the board to ask any questions that they need to ask. Thank you. I, I would like to welcome you. And I just have one question to start and uh, appreciate the additional information that was provided. Um, there are multiple TIF areas for Bensonville. Is this the only TIF area that crosses over? Because I noticed that we weren't on the distribution list for the intergovernmental discussion, and maybe that's why we sort of came late to the conversation. So this, this is really the only one that affects uh, our, within our district boundaries. Is that true? I believe so. We do have a district at um, York and Grand, um, a very small district that uh, uh, encompasses the uh, Brentwood Commons. Um, thank you. So I, I will open it up for any board questions. Um, we do have some additional information that was provided. Um, as well as information in this package, Mrs. Davies. Um, I, I, I guess I would, it would be helpful to me to get some of the, the time context because um, I'm just trying to understand that the TIF it currently won't expire for what, 11 years right now, yes, from now? And so in that 11 years, that development, the, the, the one that's been referenced, that, you know, is pursuing that property, that isn't enough time for it to do its development. I, I guess that's what I'd like you to address. Uh, yes, ma'am. The, uh, the, uh, the unfortunate nature of this property is the prior land use, which was 
prior to a, a, a golf course that, that was not able to uh, achieve greatness. It was a construction landfill. And the unfortunate part of that is to create a productive use on that site. Uh, there's uh, millions of dollars in, in premiums for uh, larger, uh, more substantial uh, structural foundations and support systems and caissons mm -hmm. that actually get, get up to uh, $13.5 million uh, by estimates to, to support a building uh, that's being proposed by uh, the developer and by, uh, by Edward Don. So um, we have looked at the, the possibility of, of living within the, uh, within the existing TIF. And we as the village, we really are going to sprint to figure out a way uh, to make it happen, uh, however uh, that may be. But the, the other um, stakeholders in this deal, AMB, which is a very sophisticated uh, real estate investment trust, and uh, in this case, Edward Don, uh, they've indicated to us that they would not be willing, nor would their lenders be willing to move forward without the uh, securitization of additional uh, years on, on this TIF district because of the exceptional costs. Mr. Carlquist. Um, Mr. Cassidy, thank you very much for being here, first of all, for helping uh, uh, pr providing the uh, material you distributed tonight and help answer some questions that came up the first time that the board uh, yes, discussed this. Um, and and you, you offline were able to share with me a little bit of background, but I, I wanted to just follow up on that, which is could you just comment again about yeah, really, it's a building on the question that was raised last time, and Mrs. Davies circled back to. Um, from this material, it says 90 roughly 90 percent of the EAV is what you, you have built into my my vernacular, the business case to to justify the the development of the of the property. Can you how, how much estimate? Because this is just pro, phone, pro forma at this point, right? We have actually had stu uh, engineers out there to to better uh, assess the costs. And, and what is the estimated revenue that the, uh, or, or tax revenue that the village is projecting would be included as a part of the developer incentives for the project overall with the, with, for the extended 11 years? The, the way it's been uh, proposed uh, is the developer would be eligible to receive up to $13.5 million dollars for TIF eligible expenses, in this case, uh, for uh, foundation systems above and beyond what a normal uh, foundation would be in any other business park. Uh, so if they don't generate uh, those expenses that are eligible under the Act, they would not receive them. Understood. And Ms. Masterton, what is the, our tax, does our tax rate um, vary or what percentage or proportion of an EAV against this property uh, does 205 access today. Do you know? I really don't know what the percentage of the total EAV or the total um, increment is um, from um, Bensonville. I mean, our rate is at currently at 331. So, um, you know, just based on that, we probably are close to the 70% that we are with the Elmer's For the balance one. Of okay, thank you. And then the other question, Mr. Cassidy, I, 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 you, you answered, but I think it's very important, maybe you could just comment, but it's very important to point out as well, is that included in this proposal is an extension only for the portion of that property that would require the development, the, the new development, that the area of the existing TIF that has been developed, which is the hotel that's on that, you know, it's contiguous to the property in question, that that would be released at the end of the initial TIF. And, and other taxing bodies like 205 and the city, uh, 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 the village of Bensonville and the like, would begin to generate uh, uh, tax revenues off of that property, uh, whatever the increment uh, is or the assessed valuation. Is that correct? That, that is correct. And, and actually, we talked uh, with Dr. Krizik and uh, Ms. Masterson about a couple of different concepts, one of being carving it out, which is a little bit more difficult but achieving the same thing in, in requiring the village to distribute a surplus, any increment uh, generated by that parcel, by the hotel. Uh, the good thing, I think, about that is we're going to see, uh, we have, there's a new owner of the country and suites. It's going to change flag to a Holiday Inn, 
and they want to reface and, and transform that hotel inside and outside. And part of their uh, goal, starting to build on momentum that we're seeing on this development, is to uh, create a uh, conference center and restaurant, something our community uh, really needs. So that is going to create a greater increment that's not accounted for in these numbers, but that will go back uh, as surplus to all the dis districts uh, in 2022. Well, certainly it's in both of our interests to see that property develop optimally so that at the point in time in which it is released uh, and reaches the end of the TIF and released back to the tax rolls at, at its full assessed valuation, that the taxing bodies are able to, uh, again, realize the full economic value of that property. How that's done, whether it's done through a release or whether it's done through uh, an, an assurance of surplus um, is, is something that could be resolved. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a, a question, and, and this might be um, to, to our, our table over here. Uh, we have a draft intergovernmental uh, agreement, and uh, this was a pretty complex task when we handled our, our own um, within the, the uh, community of Elmhurst. Is this something that our attorneys have looked at, and, and you know, how, how would we frame, you know, to Mr. Carlquist's point, how our expectations would be um, of how the surplus or uh, would be of the property that is not being extended. Ms. Masterson and I thought, depending on the direction of the board, then we would engage legal counsel to review the negotiated, uh, the, the intergovernmental agreement as would be expected um, by the village of Bensonville. And so we would forward that on for their um, input and deliberation and rely on legal counsel to ensure that the best interests of the district are represented in that intergovernmental agreement. Um, but rather than engage the services of legal counsel now before we knew the direction of the board, we just thought it was more prudent to wait until you made a decision. Mr. Carlquist. Yeah, to, to that end, I, I, I would like to uh, suggest that with board support that we move in that direction. I mean, it, it makes sense to me that we would see, as, as community, we'd see that property develop, which will improve the valuation of the property that's prepared to be released or the surpluses that would come from that portion of it. Uh, as Mr. Collins and others have pointed out, it will bring jobs at, you know, to, to and, and uh, economic development to an important shared uh, area of our community, of our school district. And, and again, my interest is, <clears throat> is, primarily, is primarily twofold. One is whether this incremental, uh, this extension for the undeveloped landfill golf course piece was essential to the development of that property. And it's hard to tell with any certainty, but at least based on the business case that's, that's laid out, I mean, it's understandable that the proposal, um, you know, that the de a developer would say that's, that's uh, important. And then secondarily is making sure that it's not a, I will gladly pay you Tuesday on the piece that would be carved out, but in fact, there is some certitude to what the, uh, the District 205 could expect in terms of some, uh, the way, not necessarily what the amount would be, was our crystal ball won't look that far out, but, but, the, um, but the manner in which tax revenues that would be due to the district for the, the hotel property or convention center or whatever it becomes, it, whether it's a release or whether it's assurances on, on, um, on um, uh, surplus, release surpluses. That's what I would hope or ask that our council would develop. Looking for uh, just commentary or a form of a motion? Um, I, I, first, I was looking to see if there were any other questions, and, and otherwise, I, I would look for a motion. And Mrs. Deroni? I've got the same problems with this intergovernmental agreement that this, um, yeah an intergovernmental agreement that I did with the one when we extended the TIF in Elmhurst in 2004, and that is <laughs> these surpluses are pretty vague. Um, I would really like to see some teeth put into that in the sense of, as you stated, Mr. Carlquist, how the surplus would be um, computed. We, have, we, under, we are under an extension right now of an intergovernmental agreement of a TIF extension in our own area in the city of Elmhurst proper, and it doesn't look like we're going to see anything. Um, now, a lot of that's due to the economy, but at the time, we were just told, absolutely, these surpluses will be granted, don't worry, we'll make you whole, on and on and on. And that doesn't look like it's going to come to pass. Now, 
I'm just reluctant to enter into another extension of a TIF without some of those things in place. Um, did, did you want to try to speak to that? I, I would, uh, I would okay. love to try. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, definitely the actual assessments are to some degree outside of our, our span of influence and control. To some degree, the, you know, we're going to rely on the assessor. But, I mean, this, is, this will all be very transparent. The, the, the PIN number for the, for the hotel, that whole property, uh, it will be uh, assessed and you will get your rate from, from that surplus. So, I mean, it's, I think we can draft and craft language that will get you very comfortable that the, the assessor will, will uh, do their, uh, their assessment of the property, and then all districts uh, will get their, their rebates on an annual basis. So, you aren't actually releasing a portion of this property from the TIF. We're going to extend the whole thing, and we're just going to rely on you to give us the surpluses that are earned on a portion of it, because that's the piece that's developed now. Is that how this is going to work? Correct. It's, it's been subdivided, so it's been given its own uh, tax ID number and, and property index numbers. So they, the assessor will assess that separately than the vacant property. And every year, we'll get together uh, as a joint review board, and you'll get those precise numbers uh, on an annual basis. Why wouldn't you just release that piece? Uh, the, uh, the the problem we would have with that is we will not be able to assist the hotel in achieving what they want to achieve in, in expansion if we take it out of the TIF. So th that's the that's the value. I think we achieved the same thing uh, in that when the original tax increment financing district was, was to expire, we will redistribute all of that increment um, at, at, that, at that date. Uh, but we'll still be eligible to use the, uh, the tax increment financing district to assist in whether it be land acquisition for additional land for the hotel, whether it's uh, utilities, uh, stormwater detention, uh, those sort of eligible expenses so we can see, again, this is about value creation for us, and uh, this will just expand the pie to, to hopefully all, all taxing bodies. Unfortunately, we're, we're asking, asking you to, to look at more long term than any of us is comfortable with, but at the end of the day, I think this allows us to achieve uh, maximum uh, equalized assessed value that we all really desperately need. Mr. Kralquist. So my first comment would be is, again, back to looking to draft some language that could be mutually agreeable. I would see this as re re resembling more of what we have in TIF, what is it, th is 3, which is the St. Charles and, and, and 83, TIF 3, as opposed to the TIF 1, the way the extension was, you know, just speaking shorthand. My question for, for that property is, is how, how is it that the, the to be developed portion of that property is dependent upon the 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 pin uh, that has been developed in terms of the hotel. Is it if, if you're paying a surplus, you're paying what's due to each of the taxing bodies under an assessed valuation as if that property had been released. And there are some advantages to to a district to receive a surplus and not necessarily re re return it if there's again as I, the word I used earlier, some certitude that those surpluses flow. Um, but. How, how is it that that is, are you looking at flowing the cities, uh, the village of Bensonville's portion of that existing property into the, the uh, to be developed property? Or what is the economic benefit of keeping that, uh, the, the, you know, the developed property as a part of the total tip? Uh, exactly. It's just, so we have a funding source to uh, assist the development. But for the TIF here, you, you know, we're not going to see redevelopment. It's just the pro formas don't work when you have these exceptional foundations. And if you look at the, the aerial that we gave you, the, the, the dump really encompassed the, the whole site, unfortunately. Um, so we're, regardless, we're looking, in, unless it was going to stay a golf course, and that's not our core business, you know, we were not going to be uh, successful in, in getting a, a deal done. You know, they're going to they're go to existing inventory 
uh, or they're going to go do another build the suit where they don't have that. But the, incre the incremental financing that you're that you're collecting against the against the, the hotel property, right? You're going to use that increment after the expiration of the original TIF to pay out the surplus to each of the taxing bodies that would otherwise receive that if the if the TIF had terminated at its regular uh, conclusion. Yes, right? sir. And then you're going to use the incremental financing for the entire duration, the balance as well as the extension on the to-be-developed property in order to achieve the development objectives that you have. My question is, is what is the economic benefit of the first, I'm, I'm missing something, with the, okay. with the hotel property, if you're, if you're taking the incremental financing or funding there from tax revenues, distributing that in the form of a surplus, again, to Mrs. Dorney's question, what's the value of keeping that a part of the entire TIF? Uh, Can you answer that, Pat? Yeah, actually, I thought about this quite a lot because it was kind of bothering me. But, you know, based on the language that's in the intergovernmental agreement, it says very clearly that um, Bensonville shall annually during the remaining life of the TIF district, TIF district upon receipt of the incremental real estate tax revenues generated by the TIF, TIF, TIF district, I can't talk again, each year declare that portion of said incremental real estate tax revenues generated from the hotel property as surplus as defined in um, 65 ILCS 511.74-7, herein referred to as the surplus revenue. Bensonville shall provide the school district with the surplus revenue amount and the calculations used to establish same on an annual basis. Thought about this. Why wouldn't you just take it out? Well, here's the thing. With it remaining in there, let's say the hotel becomes in disrepair. It behooves them to use some of that money to build up the um, hotel so that they can continue to get um, um, commerce in there. And it's still in a TIF district so that they have some access within whatever they're using to build up the hotel. If it's out of there, there's no guarantee, and we all know with the hotel business there is never any guarantee, there's no guarantee that in three or four years that won't be abandoned and then that property is worthless to us. In this case, with their ability to continue to build up the hotel and include it in a TIF, in, including it in the TIF district, we get the surplus. Now, if the uh, if the property was abandoned, it's possible that they could issue a new TIF, and then we'd get nothing. So, in my mind, it's better for them to have the TIF as it is and us get the surplus than it is the possibility that in three or four years after it's out, they declare a new TIF and start all over. As long as it's structured for the tax amount, or just, I don't care what exactly. the other tax price for 205, like a TIF 3, which has assurances of revenue, tax revenue flows each year, <laughs> yes. as opposed to like t TIF 1, which was the extension that this board supported, you know, how right. many years ago, which was, as I said, we'll gladly pay you Tuesday. If there, if there is a surplus, yeah. then, then we'll be able to pay that. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the, the And difference. what they say upon this is the incremental real estate tax revenues gener by, generated by the TIF district each year declare that portion of said incremental real estate tax revenues as surplus. So they're not saying minus anything or anything else. They're saying that portion that's from the hotel is surplus and declared as surplus. So just a clarifying question on that. Then where where is the source of money? Should you need to continue to invest in the hotel? Where does that get funded from? From the surplus. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I think if, if they have to, to your scenario, Pat, if they have to put money back in because the hotel's in disrepair, that, that's going to suck right out of the surplus we would have gotten. So based on, if that's the assumption, I, I, I guess I'd like to see an agreement where the hotel property is released at its normal time and where we agree to extend the TIF on, on, the, on the other property, the, um, you know, the extra 12 years. But I can't, can we have an agreement that would have that? Because I think we lead ourselves for what Mrs. Deroni said, the, 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 that whole surplus, then it becomes optional. I, I think that's exactly how this IGA is drafted. Um, so, and, and I think... Not to release it, not to release it at regular time. It, that's what I'm saying. We want to release the hotel at the end of the normal TIF, Correct. not the extension. Correct. Uh, the, 
the, the area in there does not speak to any redevelopment costs that come out of the surplus as we have in some of our other TIFs. It says very clearly the revenues generated by the TIF district each year declare that portion of said incremental real estate tax revenues generated from the hotel property as surplus, not minus anything that's being re used for redevelopment, not anything else. It's saying you take that real estate tax and that is the surplus. So the hotel property real estate tax is the surplus. If they need to redevelop this hotel, they'll take that from additional revenues that they get from Edward Don. Exactly. And guess what? I never said the word Edward Don because I, you said it, so I, now I can say it. So from well, Edward it, Don. So, so, so <laughs> no, he didn't say it. You said it. Clearly, I said it. <laughs> so they would take the revenue from Edward Don and put that towards the hotel. And, and that's and that's why I, you understand. I think the spirit of what's being described. We want to make sure is have Todd, you know, puts put in there. And that's why I use the shorthand version of of a TIF three with their certitude because the difference with TIF one is it includes the clause that says if if there is a surplus and if there aren't other uh, development needs, and and that's what we need to ensure is is, is not the case here. It's our risk after 2022, 100 percent. Mr. Collins. A point of clarification, I've been quiet because as I opened Mr. Cassidy's packet here, uh, I discovered that Edward's non-partner is AMB Property Trust. Um, my employer, in fact, my group within my employer has a professional relationship with AMB Property Trust, so I'll be voting present. Mrs. Deroney. Can I just clarify one more thing? Yes, ma'am. Big piece of property. Now it's a TIF. A little portion of it has a hotel on it now. Right. You want to extend the TIF so we, someone can build a hotel on the rest of it? Not quite. No. Hotel is going to continue ticking off. We've got about 11 more years. And then that will exp what we will do is, at that point, redistribute uh, all increment coming from that uh, pair pursuit to all taxing districts. I thought I thought the other big project was a conference center. No, it's a real house and office. The Edward Don facility is currently in the process of being built. Okay. The Edward Don facility is currently um, they're looking to relocate. And so it is a three hundred thousand square foot warehouse and a fifty thousand square foot office. The pro hotel property, they are looking to add a conference center but that's separate from it. The, the extension of the TIF has to do with the Edward Don property and, and the building of that on there. Ms. Hirsch. I, I just have a, a question, uh, a clarifying question um, in terms of time frame. I, I know that um, Bensonville's had its rough times, and, and a development like this would be a great win for Bensonville. It would be a great win, honestly, for Elmhurst, a neighboring community, in terms of bringing jobs, in terms of bringing traffic and people going to lunch. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think, you know, overall, I'm absolutely pro development. It's in the best in interest of the schools in the long term to have a healthy business community that feeds into our tax base. So, in general, I'm supportive of, of these types of things. I do believe, and I, and I will tell you, this information is very helpful, and I want to take a chance to look through it. But I do, I want to understand your time frame, Thanks. and if you can communicate to us what it is that you um, would need from our board uh, in order to move ahead. And I know there's talk of you going down to Springfield. If you can just lay out, you know, what your needs are. Um, we have our needs that we need to make sure that we engage our attorneys and we are comfortable with the language and, um, you know, what's being released when and when the revenues are going to be coming because we do have to be fiscally responsible. But I think also long-term pro-development for me personally is something that I value and I think if it's in the best interest of Bensonville and it's in the best interest of interest uh, of Elmhurst, we should do it. So can you just speak to the time frame? Thank you very much. Um, I don't, mean, I don't mean to make our problem yours, but the last day to introduce bills is somewhere right around St. Patrick's Day. And um, extending beyond that, we, we're probably not going to make the schedule that 
that Edward Don is, is demanding. They, they, they want to be operational uh, in July of 2012 uh, so they can relocate over the next uh, three or four months uh, from their existing location. So, um, and it's not fair to think that your attorney is going to be able to turn around an IGA uh, that quickly. What I would uh, respectfully request in terms of your consideration is would you uh, allow a conditional letter of support uh, with the understanding that it's uh, conditioned upon a, an intergovernmental agreement acceptable to the school district, not to Bensonville, but to you, that we can go and at least get things started. Mrs. Kenroy. Can you just explain or clarify, I'm getting confused by all the different questions. Um, when you were talking about the Holiday Inn, so they're coming in and they, they're going to renovate this hotel, and they're the ones that are talking about the addition of the convention center? Yes, that's correct. Mr. Uh, Carlquist. I, I, I think uh, as a board we ought to give direction to our attorney to draft, prepare for board review at our meeting next week. Um, a letter of intent that would stipulate the interests or concerns that the board has raised here um, and and reserve our final action for next week. I mean, I think, um, uh, again, a, a TIF that could be structured like three that assures revenues is one thing. One like TIF one that uh, leaves it twisting in the breeze is, uh, is unacceptable. Uh, at the same time, that property up there we're getting bubkiss for uh, right now. Um, I'm optimistic that if you develop that property, all of a sudden the uh, the hotel property, the piece that we're talking about, uh, the AV almost instantly appreciates. Um, no, again, no guarantee what that cycle looks like ten years uh, ten years hence. Now, um, <coughs> if if this board didn't take action until Friday, that's well within your window. Um, but I, I don't think without some review by our attorney, this is something that we could just give the carte blanche to at this point. Tuesday the 8th. I, our next meeting is the 8th. Okay, I, I have one, one additional question, and it's kind of speculative, but um, obviously if there wasn't serious uh, interest by Edward Don and AMB, we wouldn't be embarking on this. What happens if uh, the deal falls through? We would like to, to move forward. Uh, we think, again, the only way to make it productive is to uh, prepare uh, for those exceptional costs. And this is the, you know, this is the only way we're able to do it, frankly. So we'd like to proceed. I didn't get it to ask you this question before. Do you have letters of agreement from all the other taxing bodies? We have um, letters from... District 2, and the fire district, the park district, and I'm not sure who else we really have to, uh, to get out there. Mrs. Davies. This is kind of an ancillary question, but are, do you have a meeting in December every year with all the taxing bodies to, to report how, you know, how the TIF has ha, has been performing isn't that a requirement yeah the that's joint a, review board yeah the joint review board now the the difference in this year we did not have that because we we transitioned our budget to a calendar year from a fiscal year so we had a 20-month budget so we anticipate that joint review board to be held this summer for, for this oh, for this tip okay and well how and many actually years we're going to meet before before that, for I think the amendment process requires a meeting with the Joint Review Board. And how many years has this TIF been in existence already? Because shouldn't there have been a Joint Review meeting every year? Absolutely. And have have we known about this? I, if, it, if it requires I, I, me to, to throw my predecessor under the bus, I'm yeah. happy to do that. <laughs> As kind as that is, we're, we're not specifically asking for that. But, I mean, again, in looking at the information here, it looks like the uh, primary distribution list are the taxing bodies that are within the majority of the TIF area. And since we're ancillary, 
I mean, I had made the assumption that perhaps we weren't included. So, Ms. Masterton, you are saying that you have participated in these in the past? I've been invited to them in the past. I think I went to one. Um, I, I, I believe Ms. Palmier also has been invited and perhaps uh, attended one or two. Um, these tend to be, okay, thank you very much and see you. And they don't need us there for a vote and they do send us all the information every single year, so. Okay, with that, I, um, I would ask for a motion. Um, Mr. Carlquist. I move the Board of Education direct uh, council to prepare a, a letter of intent uh, or um, intergovernmental agreement. I mean, if, if it's more expedient to do that, then let's just do that. We have enough precedent um, to, to prepare for board review at its March 8th meeting a letter of intent or intergovernmental agreement for that would that would authorize the extension of the TIF for the newly developed portion um, and provide for um, um, yeah, a certain distribution of, equip, uh, of, of either release of, of the uh, TIF, the hotel TIF section, or distribution uh, with some certainty uh, for the uh, equivalent tax revenues in, in the years after the TIF would otherwise have expired. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a second by Mrs. Conroy. I'm going to, uh, is there any board discussion? Okay, seeing none, Mrs. Walsh, can you please call the roll? Mr. Kalkwitz? Yes. Ms. Conroy? Yes. Mrs. Droney? Yes. Ms. Hirsch? Yes. Mrs. Davey? Yes. Mrs. Astage? Yes. Mr. Collins? Present. Thank you, six ayes, no nays, one present, that motion carries. So again, thank you, we appreciate uh, you coming to share additional information and uh, we will have further discussion once we get uh, closer in our agreement form. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your time and, and consideration. Thanks. Okay, we will uh, move to uh, the next item on our agenda and that is our ongoing uh, discussions. Um, in regard to our uh, proposed budget reductions. Um, I will introduce Dr. Krizik again. Ms. Masterton and I are going to just do a very brief overview, walk you through this PowerPoint that we put together for this evening and then open it up for discussion. I do want to share with you that we've invited Mr. John Rutter and Ms. Rachel Shepard here this evening to be able to answer any questions that you might have with regards to the interscholastic revised EPR proposal about the increase in fees or and or the tiered feed structure tiered fee structure. So they're both here in, this, in the um, audience um, this evening as well. Um, so if we can move to the, we are having the PowerPoint up. Um, we presented the EPRT overview on February 8th, 2011. At that time, the board then identified a $3 million net reduction to the FY12 budget. We presented a revised EPRT overview on February 22nd with updated information from several committees. And since the February 22nd meeting, we gathered additional information in response to board inquiries. Um, it, as a result of all of that work, we are now about to, about to embark on sharing with you some revisions to the proposals with regards to reductions as well as additions um, since the February 22nd meeting. And as been our practice, Ms. Masterton will review the reductions. I'll review the additions. Ms. Masterton. Our first slide is just a very quick view of our reduction summary that we presented to you on, on February 22nd. Um, and at that time, the total reductions um, were 2732501 Those were not the net reductions, but the EPERT reductions that had been, that we were recommending at that point. Um, on two tw now with our, our latest ones, we've made some additional changes, added some um, um, dollars back, and um, included the additional non EPERT, uh, some additional non EPERT um, savings. So in technology, uh, Mr. Smith was um, able to find an additional thirty thousand dollars, which increased our non um, our our technology reduction to four hundred thirteen thousand seventy five dollars. 
um, the rest of them remain the same until we get to administrative services where we re revisited um, the recommendation for the reduction of two assistant principals. We do not feel that we can do that with any, um, 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 without significantly impacting the running of the schools. Therefore, we revisited it and added back an additional 259,441 that reduced the reduction to 242,553. In music, um, we changed our recommendation from a 10% reduction to a 5% reduction um, and added back $89,850. I think um, Mr. Um, Riddle and uh, Mr. Pavlik very eloquently described how they're going to make those changes, and we very much appreciate the sharing of resources that they're looking at. Um, and um, then moving down to communications, we included the elimination of foundation funding from the district of $26,000. So that increased um, our recommendation to 48792 for a reduction for communications, which the foundation does fall under that department. In summer school, we um, had some additions that were recommended as part of, the, part of the EPERT. We think we can do things a little bit differently. So without accepting all the additions, we added an additional $10,000, um, increasing the reduction to 25436 And in transportation, as we talked about, we added band and athletic bus fees of $57,750, increasing that reduction to 292901 in total um, the reduction summary would now be uh, for epert reductions is 2,506950 for that i should say for programs that fall under the epert then we added additional reductions that were not under the line um, for epert in early childhood, $64,283 in supplies and materials. Um, early childhood has had um, a lot of additional revenue this year from ARRA funds, and they're very well equipped, so we believe that they can handle this reduction. Um, in special education, $60,000. These are the same as we had had before. Curriculum and instruction, $111,100. Class size, the 5%. 1094914 and professional services fees of um, $30,000 for a total of 1360297 adding the 228 uh, 11 reductions that we just presented that comes to 3867257 in reductions Going towards new expenditure recommendations, last week on February 22nd, we identified six different expenditure recommendations um, that were identified in the level three um, EPERT reports. In curriculum, it was the restoration of the director of research and assessment. Reading support services, we identified only two new FTE reading specialists at the middle school level. Gifted, 3.5 um, FTE reach teachers. Um, in order to, in anticipation of the possible loss of uh, grant funding for the at-risk program, we had recommended that um, the district supplant that. It is important also to point out that whether or not we receive the grant or not, we will not hear from uh, the State Board of Education until late September, early October, and rather than have an interruption in service, it would be important to begin the program at the start of the school year. So we would not know until late September, early October, if in fact we were, to, we were awarded a grant based on the new rubric criteria. Um, we identified a 1.5 um, FTE and additional psychologists and a 0.4 increase in personnel and special education to be implemented at York in order to provide us with a full continuum of services um, for a program with students with social emotional um, disorders, again, at the high school. Today, we've made some modifications to those uh, recommendations. Um, the recommendation under curriculum and instruction to support the director of research and assessment department, in addition to including a, uh, the director, there was also the support of clerical support um, for that position. We have removed the clerical support for that position, and we would just look to reorganize and reallocate those responsibilities within the district office. 
as it related to reading support, as you recall at the last meeting, I think it was Mr. Collins that asked the question, is 2.0 FTE reading support adequate um, to meet our needs going forward to provide the necessary interventions for students? So um, uh, Dr. Sullivan had asked her staff to take a closer look at that. Originally, they were true to the only having a 10% increase, so they did not go beyond the 10% increase. Had additional money be uh, uh, found or made available or reallocated, as we usually do now from this point forward, they would actually double that and have a total of four FTE reading specialists, three identified at the middle school and one additional reading support specialist at Conrad Fisher. Again, the concept here being putting our resources of schools most in need and making those des decisions based on that. Nothing changed with gifted and advanced placement. Nothing changed with early childhood at risk. As it related to related services, um, we scaled back the 1.5 FTE in psychologists to one additional psychologist. Um, so there was the reduction of, of the new expenditure that got scaled back down. And then the uh, special education recommendation remained as presented last week with no change there. The original expenditures that were advanced to you at our first meeting um, totaled $1,038,746. The expenditures advanced to you on February 22nd um, equated to a new expense of $798,746. And the revised expenditures advanced to you today um, equal $857,146. The net change from the original um, is a less $181,600. So if we look at the total reductions of $3,867,257, the total new additions of $857,146, we have a net reduction of $3,010,111, which gets us to what our charge was uh, several weeks ago to get a net $3 million in reductions. Before you open for discussion, we just kind of want to talk about what our next steps in the process, and that would be to finalize the reduction in additional expenditures, to approve a, the expenditure reduction in addition recommendations at the March 8th Board of Education meeting, and then to finalize the staffing plan for FY12 at the March 22nd Board of Education meeting. We would need to go into the March 8th board meeting with a set of recommendations that specified what our reductions were going to be. Once those decisions are approved, we would um, take the impact of those decisions as it related to the impact on human resources and make the appropriate recommendations for a um, reduction in force um, for staff. Again, the school code indicates that if we are making reductions in force, we have 60 um, calendar days for non-certified, I mean, for, for non-tenured individuals. The March 22nd date puts us well within the, um, uh, the timeline for non-tenured individuals. For some reason, if one of those recommendations was a that's 45 days, not 60. 45 days for non-tenured. Excuse me, I want to clarify that. 45 days for non-tenured. And should there be one tenured individual in that group on the basis of position, because there might be a small group uh, representing mm -hmm. a, a group, we have, si we have 60 calendar days, and March 22nd still allows us to meet that timeline as well. So that's kind of what our next steps are in the process. We had sent you some additional information based on the questions that you had asked at the table. And again, we have um, Mr. Rudder and um, Ms. Shepard here this evening to um, answer any questions that you might have with regards to um, the tiered uh, fee structure strategy and as well as student athlete participation in one sport, two sport, and three sport information, which was asked for at the last meeting. So Mrs. Ostajik, whoever you want to move forward with this meeting. Thank you. Mrs. Conroy. Um, I would like to start with the interscholastic sport. Um, I think we need to have a conversation about this as a board. Um, the priority is to retain the seven sports. My concern now are the level of the fees and how expensive they're getting. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Rudder a question, and my question would be, um, 
was there any consideration given? I know that a couple of coaches were offering up 10% cuts in their individual sports, and I'm curious as to why it was, consideration wasn't given to giving 10% cuts across the board in each of the um, interscholastic sports at York. Do you mind if I bring some back up too? <laughs> we did in fact uh, look at the 10% across the board, but when we were asked to cut, I believe it was $85,000 at the beginning, once we looked at the 10% across the board, it did not meet the necessary 10% cut. Um, okay, I understand that. So now when we're talking about the tiered fee, and I, I support the tiered fee, um, but my concern are the students or the families that maybe are already struggling to pay these fees. Um, I think we have a responsibility as a board to find a way to solve that problem. Um, so I would be interested in talking a little more about going back and revisiting those 10% cuts in addition to the tiered fees so that we could provide something to our students that can afford these fees. The other thing I'd like to know is, have you looked into any sponsorship fees? Um, and I know that this is kind of new territory and thinking outside of the box, but um, I would like to consider possibly, I know Gatorade is a top tier sponsorship. Um, we could provide some sort of scholarship to our students through a sponsorship fee that I don't know how that would be tied, if it would be tied to free and reduced lunch, that would be a flag to say if, if this free and reduced lunch child were to play a sport, we need to flag that person and say, you know, let's, let's take a look and see if he's interested in sports, can we help them out? We are both with you and on your side on that one. We do believe that the $160 fee uh, would be a, a drastic change to many of our students. Currently, at $110, we, we have many students who cannot afford to participate in our athletic programs. Uh, fortunately, we have a uh, Dukes in Need program, which has allowed us to uh, allow some of those students to participate. Uh, we, too, looked into some corporate sponsorships, Gatorade, uh, I hope you have that packet that was sent over to you. Uh, we have begun looking into that. Uh, we've been given permission to start to look into that, so we have indeed done that. Um, I, I guess we could report now that we're, we are, it's at the very beginning of that process, but we have had a couple of representatives in who seem to be very uh, encouraging shall we say, in that that's a possibility down the road. We'd like to get your permission to do so and move in that direction. The other thing we looked at was the possibility of doing some fundraising. Uh, typically our fundraising programs are now done by sport. I think it's important, we had this conversation as coaches, that now perhaps this fundraising needs to be done as an athletic program to support all sports, uh, all of our student athletes. Can you just, um Explain to me, because I don't understand. I haven't heard of Dukes in Need. I think that's wonderful. Can you explain that process to me and how our kids identified? Feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We, um, in the past, the last school year, were able to have students on the financial aid program that were recognized on the financial list um, in the beginning of the school year. And last year we had a total number of 73 students that qualified to exist in the athletic program as well as on the financial aid list. Uh, and their fees were waived in the past as a result of being on the financial aid list. This year we were told that, well, the initiative was that we couldn't waive the fees for individuals that were on the financial aid list. So um, in cooperation with the administration at the high school, a fund was created to help those students still participate in athletics even though they were on the financial aid list. Just a clarifying question, where do the resources for that funding come from? This year, as a matter of fact, if I, if I recall, uh, it came from a rebate from our senior pictures through the photography company. Ms. Hirsch. Just on the same topic, can I ask Ms. Masterton, we currently have students who are in the middle school music program that uh, it, it's my understanding that that program is not, even though a student might be on free and reduced lunch, we do not currently have a program in place to waive that fee for band, orchestra, or chorus. So we have some inconsistencies in implementation of providing for students that are free and reduced lunch. Is that accurate? 
the free and reduced lunch program, we are not allowed to request any um, proofs of income in the free and reduced lunch program. Consequently, throughout the state, there have been higher numbers of free and reduced lunch than perhaps um, might have been in the past. The waiver program um, requires us to follow the free and reduced lunch guidelines in terms of income, but does allow us to ask for the proofs of income. And within that, we do follow that on the free side. What is waived are all, um, all instructional costs and um, uh, non-voluntary costs. So clubs are not waived, um, athletic fees are not waived, um, uh, band and orchestra are not waived. Those are the fees that are not waived because those are optional fees. Yeah. Behind the wheel is now waived um, because it's part of the curriculum. When it was after school and it wasn't part of the curriculum, then it could be waived because it's it, it's part of the curriculum. It's no longer it, it must be waived. Now. It must be waived now, and it wouldn't before. It's tiring. So, Mr. Carlquist. First, I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Rutter, and the entire uh, EPR committee that worked on the extracurricular athletics uh, recommendation for being responsive to the board's interests and going back and reworking or perhaps even resurrecting some of your original discussions and bringing forward to the board the, the, the new additional uh, options that you did. I think it, it was responsive to what the board's uh, primary interest uh, has been, which is to preserve the opportunity for students to be able to participate in these programs, recognizing how important uh, a robust extracurricular program is and, and the value that it can provide to students as a part of their co-curricular uh, ac activity. So thank you for the responsiveness. Thank you for addressing that, that key requirement. Number two, uh, I, I, I too share the, the interest in having some type of a tiered structure in place. When fees were first um, looked at uh, in at any kind of an appreciable increase for athletics um, a number of years ago, the district took in total the stipends that were paid out across the entire athletic program, took 20% and said 20% of that freight should be borne by the user. And that's the way that we got to, in essence, the $110 from, I think, before that was $40 uh, per season per student uh, fee, roughly. And, and that made sense to try to have some rationale. You know, when the board would look at increasing fees, you'd say, well, what do you tie it to? Do you tie it to the marketplace? Well, you can't tie it to the private clubs and all. You want to have a sense of that. But, but private clubs, frankly, are a lot more expensive than, than, than the fees that we're charging. We want students to be able to participate and not have it be a, a hardship. So the board strove to have some kind of uh, grounded in, in, in fact that first uh, piece. Now the great work has been done by the EPER committee and the athletic department to come up with what you know, much closer and a much more granular level what the actual costs are for, for all the sports down to a per participant level. And and there is a great deal of, of, of variety. As I recall, it ranges something from about $145 per student up to about eleven twelve hundred dollars $1,200 per student for those sports. So tiering makes a lot of sense. But I also think that there is interest in finding ways in the spirit of EPERT to control costs, to find ways to economize uh, and, and can appreciate that that may not, I mean, that wasn't necessarily the direction to do that across all sports or where or how to do that. I have heard raised, and this is more now a question for you, Dr. Krizik or Ms. Masterton, which is um, some questions that, are, that, that come up about, and, and in many cases, or in some cases, it's been tied to, I'll say, the, the, the charity, the magnanimous uh, spirit of Elmhurst and people willing to volunteer time in all sorts of ways, ranging from coaching to concession sales to, uh, to uh, wh whatever it might be to support the, the, the extracurricular uh, programs. There are potentially contractual issues um, when it, we get into this range of what's covered under the contract and what stipends are, are paid and the like. How do we, as a, as a district, as a board, tap into the spirit of volunteerism that exists in the community, achieve the desire of controlling costs and not just going to the revenue generating line of fees, although for the next fiscal year, 
I'm, I'm fine with that as long as we address the concern that's been raised about, you know, hardship cases. But how do we move in a direction of, of having a contract that provides some flexibility or maybe a, re, a review of what's covered by stipends, the extent of those stipends, and and what activities that perhaps today are are being paid for out of those stipends that perhaps don't don't necessarily need to be. I mean, for example, if gate receipts at an athletic event uh, aren't even enough to cover the stipends of the person who's collecting those gate receipts. That'd be a, you know, one place to start. Can, can you address that? The current contract language states that the, that the board has the right to eliminate any stipend. And we did that last year with some stipends, not related to athletics, but we did, we had a long list of reduced stipends. Certainly, I think that as we would go into something, let's say, like potentially reducing the number of athletic stipends, I think that we would look to Mr. Rudder and Ms. Shepard to say, share with us what you think is a safe um, paid supervision of, of an adult student ratio. So that we might say our minimum, making something up, is one to X number of students. Any, any additions beyond that would either be done th through volunteerism I make you know to, to your suggestion and in the event that we were unable to get um, volunteers I don't think we'd want students to be penalized by eliminating the num level of students participating because we couldn't get a volunteer whether or not then there would be the consideration of having either a part-time stipend return or something to that effect so there is the ability within the contract to um, the board always has the right to add stipends into the contract and take stipends away. What happens at the collective bargaining table is, is the negotiation of what the amounts of those stipends are if those are changed. So if there was a stipend that was worth $2,000, we don't have the right to unilaterally say, well, we're going to reduce that stipend to $1,600 by taking, you know, 20% off of that. We, we don't have the right to do that. That only comes through collective negotiations. But Eliminating stipends and or adding stipends back in is certainly, um, you know, our prerogative. I do believe that um, I don't know what IHSA rules say about um, supervision related to athletics and whether or not uh, an entire program could be run by volunteers or if, in fact, it has to be there has to be some remuneration coming between the board um, and students. The other piece is we have supervisory issues that we want to deal with, and all of our volunteers would have to go through criminal background checks. I believe they go through the criminal background check process now. You'd want to hold your volunteers to the same rigorous standards that we hold any um, employee to in order to ensure the safety of all students. I would also suggest that um, we have a very generous community. And I know uh, last year when we instituted the $10 club fee, many of the schools went to their PTAs and said, we have kids who, who can't afford to be part of, of the club. Can you help us? And uh, you know, I think several of the um, PTAs uh, established funds for, for those purposes. Um, the boosters have certainly been um, very generous in their contributions, and um, perhaps you know it might be um, a way to go back to um, uh, uh, the boosters and ask them to establish a similar type of fund for those students who cannot be part of it. I'm sure we can forego some um, additional purchases that we might receive. I also know that we are in negotiations currently right now with um, with uh, Coca-Cola. Um, we've just received um, information from them. So there will be a little bit of money from that as well. Some of it goes back. To, it's a rebate based on the number of cases purchased. It will probably come to about $60,000. However, part of that money goes to food service because a, a large amount of that is bought by food service. So when we figure out the proportions of food service versus um, the, uh, the machines, in the various places, we'll work that out, but there'll also be a little bit of money to that, which we could also just put straight into, you know, a separate line item for revenue and expenditure for, um, for that fee. Thank for you. So, so, Mr. Rudder, I think you, you, 
at least express myself, which is is protecting, preserving participation. Tiering makes good sense. Um, sponsorship seems like a, a reasonable way to at least proceed, you know, with with evaluating and and then. Um, tap it, finding ways to allow us to more broadly tap into the generosity of the community either through contributions or through volunteerism, but all that I think becomes predicated on our ability to control costs going forward, which is finding ways voluntarily within you know any of our programs to be able to contain and, and reduce costs or get some efficiencies wherever we can. So. Sure. And if I might add, Mr. Carlquist, we have uh, and I think you'll probably heard that from all the committees. The, the goal here was to eliminate as least amount of kids as possible. We wanted to keep as many kids involved as we possibly could. And and even the $10 activity fee that Ms. Masterton is talking about has created quite a large stir in, in our building. Uh, many students not being able to afford that $10 fee. Uh, so anything we can do going forward to try to keep as many kids involved uh, would be terrific. I know that one of our pr proposals, and, and Ms. Masterton told us that it was a contractual issue, uh, did involve the eliminating of some, some possible coaching stipends. Uh, we felt without hurting our kids. Uh, unfortunately, part of that also had uh, a large sum of money coming from our uh, playoff stipend. Uh, which again is contractual. We'd like to see that worked out. That eliminated very, very few kids. We felt like it hurt minimal amount of kids. Uh, unfortunately, many of that was, uh, much of that was related to the contracts. So we were not allowed to go forward with that. Um, but I think the bottom line is we, we want to do what we can to try to keep as many kids involved as possible, just as I know each and every one of you would like to see too. Ms. Hirsch. I just have one um, additional mm -hmm. nit, if you will, and that is um, I agree with Mr. Carquist that there needs to be some kind of rationale when we are asking families to step up and bear the burden of the cost of providing the program. Um, and I, I do support the tiered fees. I think it's unfortunate to have to raise fees, but um, for <coughs> me personally, I have a son who plays hockey and a, girls who ride, a girl who rides horses. I, I'm accustomed to paying <laughs> high expenses, unfortunately, for their endeavors. Um, and I'm, I'm not recommending that that's, you know, everybody has the ability to do that. But I do think that there needs to be some consistency in terms of the tiers, in terms of the cost to us and the amount that we're asking the families to bear the burden. And so uh, on a couple of nits, I know that you, we had asked for some rationale in terms of how we determine which sport was going to fall into which tier. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just offer a little bit of pushback in terms of staying true to the cost per athlete and making a couple of switches, specifically basketball, um, I think boys basketball, girls basketball are well over $850 an athlete. And in the top tier, we've got bowling and palms, which are, you know, 573 or $611. So I think we need to, to make a swap there in order to be consistent with, you know, here's how much it costs us to run the program. We're asking you to pay a portion of that. Um, so I'd like to see that, that change. Sure. And before we go any further, if I could make sure that we're on the same page, because I'm feeling kind of like we might not be. When we saw the, the new recommendations, I think it involved the cross-the-board fee, not the tiered fee. So I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. We're talking across the board, everybody paying the same fee, correct? For purposes of tonight's presentation, until the board had a conversation, we just we just carried forward the same recommendation from the last time, which was um, restoring all seven sports, the restoration of all seven sports. And as Ms. Masterton stated at the last meeting, she sought to capture as much money in a reduction as possible. However, you know that there is a difference of about seven thousand dollars between the tiered fee and the flat fee. I think what you're hearing conversation at the table is is that there are some members of the board that would like to go towards a tiered fee structure with modifications to the structure that you have put in place. Sure. So that adjustment would then be reflected at the um, at the March eighth meeting. Those those recommendations. Okay, I just want to make sure we're talking about. Same thing, um, and I and I guess we'll jump in and feel free to jump in on the tiered. The three and four tier seems to be the, the, the part of the problem here with the basketball, soccer, volleyball, etc. As compared to the tier four, 
which involved the palms, bowling, those kinds of things. Um, what we tried to look at, and, and obviously we're open to any kind of recommendation you'd like to make, what we tried to look at were several different things. Um, the number of students involved in each of those programs, the cost uh, that I think you find in the Tier 4 is the facility rental cost, which, which is a big cost to us and continues to rise. Um, we looked at the number of athletes involved in the, in the entire program. So we tried to take a look at all those different kinds of things, and, and I can tell you that um, what you see here on Tier 3, those sports actually do cost a little bit less per athlete to the Tier 4 athlete as we've proposed here. Now, can those be adjusted? I'm sure that those can be adjusted. Um, I'm a golfer too. I know how expensive golf can be. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that they need to be the highest, but, but when we look at it, we're talking about a, a small number of, of individuals involved in the program and a high rental fee. Uh, that, makes the, that makes the cost per athlete. You know, I, I, I'm just going to sound in as long as everybody's talking about this specific area. I, I have always been an advocate of trying to keep everything as accessible to all students as we can. But we are now in a, at a point uh, fiscally where we can't afford everything that we have. And uh, for that reason, I, I, I do support the tiered fees. And what may come of this is we may have sports that are too expensive for our students and our families or only a few kids can access them. And then we're, we'll have to make the very difficult decision of whether or not we can continue that. So what we've heard from, you know, our, our parents and community is, you know, let us pay for this. But we are creating a situation of, you know, those that can afford it get to do it and those that, which is, you know, to me very contrary to the concept of the public education. However, you know, we're also talking about extending computers and software to a point where when it breaks, I'll fix it, and, you know, I can't invest at the level. So it, we're not just talking about sports here. The depth of cuts across all of these programs is pretty substantial. Um, Mrs. Deroni. Thank you. I was going to ask you for your rationale behind the tiering, and I think you addressed at least the top two. Um, I really would be in favor of one fee for athletics, and not because it brings another $7,000 to the district, but I just think if you want to play sports at York, there's what it costs, you know, and with the understanding that there's people who aren't going to be able to afford that, but I, I'd hate for people to be picking and choosing because that's all they can afford. You know, if their passion is some sport and we feel it's worthy enough to offer that sport to our students, then I would support this, the one fee, the same fee for every sport at York and working through our boosters. I think that's a great, great suggestion, boosters and PTAs, to supplement that, to pick and choose students who are worthy of a complete waiver, to see if they can't underwrite $10 for everybody. You know, I don't know. I don't know what kind of money they have, but I think it's a great um, resource to to look to, um, but I would I would support the straight fee. Same same price everybody. M Mrs. Conroy, um, my concern with the same price for everybody would be um, how do you address kids that are two and three season athletes? I mean that's going to bring that cost, and I know I was told I was the only one who did that last year, but um, how do you? How would you offset that? Because that would be really difficult. You're talking four or five hundred dollars to play three sports in a year for one one participant. You're right. You're absolutely right. Currently, we have a cap of four hundred fifty dollars. I would anticipate that that cap would then go up. Um, you're right. I mean, we're we're here. We're encouraging kids to become involved, and now we're now we're forcing them to pay a lot of money, particularly those those with more than one sibling. Uh, involved in our athletic programs, which is is quite a quite a lot of of students. Um, so I would anticipate some sort of a a look into that cap, perhaps. Um, the four hundred and fifty dollar cap is per family. Is that correct? Because that's that, correct, right? I, 
I just want to make sure we're, we're giving direction that's helpful. Um, we've heard, had some people say they would prefer the tiered structure. Um, Mrs. Deroni communicated she would uh, prefer the flat structure. If we were going to get something we should support, I guess I'd just like to hear a quick consensus from the board. Mrs. Davey. I'm, I, this has been very helpful just to talk through this. Um, I think I'm, I, I, I agree with what you said, Mrs. Ostajik, about we have to be careful uh, uh, about the, the, the tenets of public education and, 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 you know, allowing opportunity and access for all, you know, within reason. You know, we, we do have our budget uh, certainly to consider. And, and I, I think because of that tenant, I think Mrs. Deroni brings up a very valid point that we should just, we should just have a fee. And I think that adding the complications of what that maximum per family could be if you're you know you're in the more expensive sports or not it just seems more clean cut sends a better message if it is just per per child per sport so i will weigh in on on that option mr collins did you want to voice in on this I prefer the tiered structure. Otherwise, we're, our children, are, some of our children are subsidizing other sports. And I think we heard from Mrs. Deroni. Um, Mrs. Hirsch, did you say you supported the tiered structure? Mr. Carlquist, did you want to? Uh, I, I, I support the tiers. I, you know, I, I, I wish we could have one low or no fee across the board. I agree with the sentiments, the spirit, but uh, I think two things. Number one is when we look at the costs uh, as they've been laid out by the committee, there's enough variation and we have the data now. Now that we have the data, I think we should price it let that way unless the administration tells us that to implement it would far outweigh, you know, the, the, I mean, the complexity and the costs. And secondly, look at, look at our textbooks. We charge students actual costs for textbooks based on the courses that they take. I would like students not to have to pay for textbooks at all, and that, that's provided, but we, we can't do that. And that's, a, that's another form of user fee tied to what the user selects. So I think it would be consistent to do the same with athletics. Mrs. Conrad. Um, I also support the tiered fee, and I think there's another small piece to consider with the tiered fee, and that's at the higher cost, the ones that cost more are, have lower participation, and they also are, I have a son who participates in one of those sports, um, you are accustomed to paying more for those sports in general. So I think that's going to be something that's going to be overall accepted in, in that regard. And I think if you switch it to everybody paying the same amount, you're putting a larger burden on families, on individuals with one child as well as multiple childs in the school. I think that's problematic. Ms. Hurt. I, I I already stated that I supported the tiered fees, but the other piece that I want to make sure, and maybe some other board members want to chime in, I do want to see us really tighten up the expenses across the board for each of the each of the organizations. There were some great variances when we looked at expenditures for transportation. There were great variances when we looked at the cost of equipment. I'm still trying to find out how we're spending $10,000 on basketballs for the boys. <laughs> but th there's a lot of discrepancies, and I think that um, we could not only tighten those up, but I think we could also be more consistent and so that the board, ha at a higher level, we have a better understanding of what the costs of implementing the programs are. And we would definitely be in favor of that. It wasn't $10,000 in basketballs only. It was for the basketball program. It wasn't basketball. <laughs> and the tra <laughs> or it was a really good basketball. Um, and the other part of that, the transportation, just real briefly, keep in mind some of our programs are not there's no space for them to practice on site, so they're transported each day to an off site facility to do the practicing. Mrs. Davey. Are, are we ready to move on to other topics? We, we are. So are thank you. We appreciate, uh, you know, people might think we're spending a lot of time on a topic that, even though it's not curricular, we all understand how important it is to keep our students engaged in school. And so, you know, I think this. Uh, by having areas of interest that they can engage in outside of the classroom. So uh, we appreciate the time that you've spent in this. Mrs. Deroni. Did you weigh in on tiers or no tiers? I, I did weigh in on tiers. I support the tiers okay. because I believe the no tiers might price more children out of all sports. So if we can keep some at a lower cost to provide access, we may end up with sports that 
parent families can't afford and that'll help us decide that we can't retain them. Mr. Rudder and Ms. Shepard, if by Wednesday morning, if I could get a revised tiered recommendation based on the feedback that you had about some of the concerns with where things were placed in the tiers. I think I heard some suggestions here at the board table to move some things around based on cost. Sure, we'd be happy to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, so we're, we will move on. Uh, Mrs. Davey. Thank you. Um, first, I, I, I hope that it's clear that every dime is important in this process. Uh, and and, and I, I take that as, I mean that as a compliment to our administrators that have worked so hard to come up with, you know, getting to that magic number that we've been looking for. But I think that it shows a diligence on all of our part to be respectful of every dollar that's being spent in our district. And I think that is, is worth stating. I had asked for the net, the, the net staff change, and I'm, thank you for putting this together. It was it was very helpful to me because I, you know, all the e-port reports had we had some additions of staff, we had some some areas where we thought we could have a reduction in staff, and so just to put them all together to see exactly what that uh, was going to look like, and to know that with all the reductions of, of dollars that we're making, plus the list we saw of additions, which I think was adding some tremendous help for our students. So, you know, some of our additional staff, are, you know, our reading specialists and and the psychologists. You know, we're 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 adding some very important pieces to help our students. The net reduction is 12 staff, 12.05 staff people, and I, I think that that. That's significant. It's significant to know that we have tried to go through this process. The administration has tried to go through this process and all the committees and find places that re reduce dollars other than on the backs of our staff. And so to come through this entire process and know that the net loss across the district is 12, I think is for the teachers, for the teachers, I think, and then seven non-certified but 12 teaching positions. So I think that is, uh, it's, it's very commendable that throughout the process we were able to get to, to the number that was, you know, I, I, how many did we reduce last year, last year during the process? We don't recall, Mrs. Davey. Anyway, it's a for the amount of reductions that we made to be at a net 12 loss of teachers. I think is uh, a, a very encouraging, and I want to thank you all for the hard work to get to that number. Ms. Hirsch, um, if I could switch gears, I had a, a question. Um, it's my understanding, and please correct me if I have this wrong, that um, if we talk about extracurricular clubs. Um, we are looking at funding that at, at level one. So we're looking at a 10% reduction in extracurricular clubs across the district. I do not recall seeing um, a, a descriptive of how, uh, I, I understand that the recommendations that were brought forth by the EPER committee were to, I believe it was reduce stipends, which was a contractual issue. And so I do not know that I've heard how it is that we are going to reduce the funding of extracurricular clubs if we were looking at making a specific recommendation at a, at a building level. Um, but I'd like to better understand what, um, I'm thinking it's $26,000 of cuts that we're gonna take for extracurricular clubs. Give the first part of the answer and then whatever I um, don't fill in, Ms. Masterton will. Um, it would be a 10% reduction of all the current club stipends that we have and we would have that reduced proportionately across each of the levels. Currently, I believe each elementary school has stipends for seven clubs. Each middle school has an X number of stipends, and I don't recall their number, and the high school has, has them as well. So we would take the total number of clubs offered at the middle school, at the elementary, and at the high school, add that, have the total number of 10%, and then proportionately make those reductions. So whether or not the elementaries would, again, be reduced to five club stipends, the middle schools would be reduced, and the high school would be reduced. That's really what the implementation of the 10% reduction in the club, in, in the number of clubs offered would be. 
because the other recommendation was the reduction of the stipends for um, sponsorship of clubs, and that's a collective bargaining um, negotiated item. I'm, I'm concerned at how this is going to be implemented, and again, not that this is the, for the board to implement, but I'm, I'm concerned in terms of, if I recall from the EPRT report, some elementary schools have more clubs and some of them are, are run by teachers who are either volunteering their time. I'm not sure that I full, have a full understanding. Some elementary schools don't have their full if the number seven number of clubs. So can you um, just provide a little more feedback on how we would be advising the building leaders in terms of, uh, you know, is it, a, are, is your advice going to be in terms of the number of students involved in that activity? Is it going to be, uh, uh, can you just give us a little more? We currently allow um, each of our schools to identify and develop clubs. There certainly has to be some additional guidelines coming forward, with me meaning those clubs should be occurring for the most part outside of the school day. There's some exceptions to that at the middle school. Um, as one example, student council. Student council generally meets during the school day. It's a club stipend. Not all of those activities happen during the end of the day. I do think, Mrs. Hirsch, that there is going to be a lot of work on implementation going forward. And I think that the implementation of the reductions, such as those stipends, would then involve a conversation with all of the building administrators to say what is the most effective way of addressing these club stip of, of reducing club stipends. Obviously, the um, maybe reducing those clubs at the school where there is the least amount of student participation, keeping in the spirit of having as many extracurricular opportunities available to students to engage as many as possible. There are some clubs at some of the elementary schools and at the middle school as well as at the high school with a very small number of participants. There is no differentiation in the club sponsor stipend based on the number of students that are participating in the club. So. I think that we would have a thoughtful conversation as a group of administrators to try to pre get, present some guidelines for the establishment of clubs going forward. In addition, what we have also said to administrators in the past is they have to revisit their clubs. Sometimes cl the same clubs have been there. Um, one of the recommendations to come out of our compliance report is, is to, to apply, I'll say, a sports interest survey to the middle school. We're required to do one at the high school. It was recommended that we do one at the middle school. Maybe that's another implementation piece is that they do a club interest survey at, at the elementary, at the middle school, and at the high school level too to determine you know, what, what the levels of interest might be and to be able to try to meet it based on student need. Some clubs are established because an adult has an interest in the club. It isn't based on any, I'll say, data to say that we have a group of kids that want to be in a chess club at the elementary school or that we have a group of kids that want to be in whatever other kinds of clubs there are available. But um, as we have revisited stipends before, the same clubs don't necessarily need to go forward year after year after year. I, 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 I don't think that it's really board work to, to implement how clubs are uh, implemented or managed. So, I mean, I think from the general direction of the board, I, I think you've hit the main points on that one. So um, we're gonna move on to some other topics. Um, I, I guess I would just like to understand the, the sense of the board. One of the additional uh, fee uh, recommendations was transportation, which would essentially uh, compound the increase in the athletic fees. And my sense is if we're trying to make these ac accessible to our students, you know, at some point, too much is too much. And you know, my, my Forward. I think we have a little bit of breathing room would be to pull back on the transportation fee. I just would be interested to know what other board members think about that. Ms. Hirsch. Um, I, I'm not sure that I saw the details on the transportation fee. Uh, um, if it's an early bus for the, the band and orchestra, and, and that's what we were looking at providing a fee for, I, I think... Um, and, and after school. Uh, I think those families are already as well in terms of not only the athletics but also for those instrumental programs. And I think one of the other recommendations is that we continue that on in the high school, adding those fees for those programs. I think they already bear the weight of fees as well. So I support Mrs. Ostrich in saying that I think we might be able to hold off on those transportation fees. 
I, I, I just want to let you know and remind you that um, the latest information that we've gotten from the State Board of Education is we're not going to be getting anything in transportation next year, and we are having some real big issues in terms of, of um, fund balances in the transportation fund. And so, um, you know, it may come to the point where we really have to start looking um, at, at some costs here. It's fortunate that we have some money in there, but not being able to implement, you know, $57,000 means that somewhere else we're, we're going to have to suffer possibly some reductions. And um, while I don't like the idea of this, it's not uncommon. It's all happening all over the county and all over the state that people are in. In fact, because we're a unit district, consolidated and unit districts cannot charge for regular transportation during, and I'm not talking about after school or before school, but regular transportation. But all other school districts can, even if they are receiving um, reimbursement from the state. And without the reimbursement, most everybody's looking at multiple different ways of adding transportation fees, you know, um, to do this. It may not be. Um, very palatable, but you know we're in hard times here. Mrs. Davy. Well, and I do recall the last year when we got the community input. You know, we had people, you know, um, writing into the website. We heard from several people, not one or two, but several. Char let us pay a fee to, so that you know we were willing to pay the transportation fee. I'm paraphrasing, but we're willing to pay it. Do you know to to you know allow some the program to move forward or to uh, you know to allow the offering so and transportation of all things everyone understands that 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 cost is one that has skyrocketed and is going to continue to skyrocket I mean you, you see reports we're going to be headed toward five dollar a gallon gas this summer so I I suspect that p there would be an understanding from most many people why we, we've needed to implement the transportation fee. And again, I'm just gonna throw out my counter, counter argument. We could price, our, in trying to retain these programs, we could price everybody out of all of them. And that is my biggest concern is, you know, we have a fantastic band program. Um, it's still, I mean, we're raising the band fee, still affordable, but now we're raising the transportation fee. So we've really taken the band fee up the, all of those programs up, the combined cost of those. So, you know, I have a serious concern about whether or not we're, we really are going to be able to maintain these programs. When we start to see the drop in enrollment of our students, how are we going to attribute that to, to any of these components? You know, and is the answer going to be interest waned and, you know, so we let them go. So I, I think we have some very broad and rich offerings to our students. I just want to make sure that we're not putting ourselves in a position where they disappear quietly in the night because we've made them unaffordable with a nickel here and a dime here and a dollar here and another $150 here. So that's my, my real concern. Uh, at some point we have to draw the line in the sand and say either we want to have these programs or we don't want to have these programs. Mrs. Conroy. I think when you're talking about these additional transportation fees, the one thing that that kind of is a red, red flag to me is it seems like it's disproportionately affecting the music program because the morning bus is primarily used by music students and um, I, I do have a problem with that. Mrs. Deroni. I don't disagree with anything that you've said about pricing students out of these activities, but what are you gonna cut instead? You know, we're down to where we're at. We're at the three billion point here. We've knocked seven thousand off from the tiered athletic fees. We are right at the three million. We're going to have to come up with another sixty thousand dollars someplace. I maintain that the EPERT process has come up with this fee. They looked at everything. I mean, we could go in here and pick up in each one of these areas and pick out something that that we feel is inappropriate or not going to work or not good for the education of a, a, a group of students or cutting out another group of students. Ha! I, mean, <sighs> I just think we have to go with the fees as they were presented. No one likes them. No one wants to raise these fees. No one wants to price anybody out of a program or a service that we offer. 
We pride ourselves on being rich in opportunities, but we are up against a wall at this point, so I would support these fees. As long as we have a quiet table, I'm going to uh, just approach one more. And again, uh, this, that the transportation fee was a revisit, not from the EPER committee, but from, from a second uh, stab at this. But uh, the professional service fee here assumes that uh, we go out and we rebid our attorney's fees and we find an attorney or law firm that is less expensive. And uh, my uh, my uh, recommendation on that is we are going through a change in the leadership of our district to not have some continuity in service at least through that. I, I don't think that that's a wise course to embark on at this point, um, especially when we have a relatively new cabinet in place um, and without even knowing who you, know, who you would find as a qualified firm. So I, I believe that that substantially relates to that, Ms. Masterton. We we relooked at all of our fees and everything, and the, with the changeover of um, the attorney for special education matters, we believe that we'll save that thirty thousand dollars in that alone. So it wouldn't necessarily mean having to change anything else. Thank you. I withdraw, <laughs> withdraw my concern on that, Mr. Carlquist. And while most of the legal fees are not at the direction of the board, its administration, I think the board has uh, has a role. Back to this theme of managing and controlling costs, uh, let's reduce our demands on attorneys for 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 counsel for questions. I mean, I think we can we can still have the right kinds of controls, and and as a board, as a district, and, and our administration, call them into service uh, less frequently, only when they're time is is really required not out of convenience agreed uh, mrs. Conroy um, I would like to have a discussion about an addition and that addition would be the research and assessment um, piece and the reason I'd like to just have a conversation as a board about that is because in the last couple of weeks we've had a lot of really great conversations with um, with um, superintendents that have different philosophies on how that might look and how that might be implemented and my feeling is I'd like to hold back on the actual hiring of that until we have um, a full picture going forwards of what that might look like. Mrs. Davey. Well, I don't disagree with holding back on the hiring, but based on the conversations we've had, I think it would be critical to have a placeholder for that hiring so that the next superintendent can decide how they would best like to utilize utilize that position. I think that we, we know that the, the whole data, the management of data, we, you know, we've got our data warehouse RFP out now. Um, I, I think that that is something that is critical to student success in, in helping our staff be better equipped. And so I think that it's important that we at least have a placeholder. I agree we wouldn't want to proceed with it, but it's going to, it would be within the budget year. So I really, I really was happy to see that it, it continued to be on the addition list. Ms. Hirsch. Um, I'm a person who's had a, a challenge and have, have held back against adding this director level position for a couple of years. I know it's been teed up and we've been talking about the need for it. Um, at this point, I think my original concern with it and my repeated concern over the last two years has been the level within the organization and the type of role that this individual would play. Um, with that being said, I agree with you and I recognize that we do have to have a better handle and a better assessment tools and, and better understanding throughout all levels of the organization. Um, and not just talk about data, but talk about information and how we're using that information moving forward. So I do support Mrs. Conroy's concept of let's leave the, the dollar amount, the budget budgeted item in there and allow the next leadership team to come in and to look at the structures that we have in place and to make a recommendation in terms of how to structure. I wouldn't want to tie our next leader's hands and say, here's the job description that we'd like you to go out and hire. So I am willing to leave the item, the dollars in there um, and, uh, and be presumptuous that our next leader would make a decision in terms of the best investment of those dollars. Thank you, and, and I'm, I'm going to agree with that. I think, you know, we, we've talked about uh, having our 
better decisions made uh, based upon how kids are performing and allowing that to, to help on a day-to-day -day basis, how we're instructing our students. And I think if we're not willing to put the support behind that to make sure that you know, we, we have, uh, our teachers have the ability to get to the information, information, not data, that they need to be able to, to look at uh, and to help determine how they can best use that, then, you know, we're just talking the talk. So I, I think this is a pretty important position, and I, I think we've held back on it for probably longer than we should have, but if we're really serious about moving forward and supporting our teaching staff, I think we need to make this investment. Ms. Hirsch. If I could, uh, we're switching gears quickly here, but I do have um, a, a question on um, the numbers that were provided for freshman cohort. I know that our freshman cohort, um, the incoming class, we are looking at um, a greater percentage of students that have been identified as needing cohort services. And at the same time, what we're looking at in terms of budget, we're looking at um, reducing the FTE that we are looking to put in place for next year's uh, freshmen who would be uh, requiring and would benefit from the services of cohort. So I'm trying to resolve a 0.6 reduction when our population is going up significantly. Can you help me understand? Actually, it's more the structure of, of the cohort, in particular in um, one, one portion of the class where there are numerous teachers in there and we don't believe that perhaps, or at least in, in the EPIRT process, they didn't believe that. We take into consideration um, increases in enrollment. Where there is an increase in the cohort program, there will be corresponding decrease in other classes. So it kind of, it's a wash in terms of that. So this is real, uh, this point six is more a structural change in terms of, of that reduction. I think Karen could probably speak to it a little bit better. Through my cough drop probably. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, I believe this was part of the, um, um, the, I forget the name of the learning session that they have where they have multiple teachers that are available to keep for a small group of kids. So it's just cutting down the number of, te of certified teachers that are in the room with that group of kids. Mm -hmm. Is the program implementation moving forward with the class limits in terms of the number of students in each section or are we raising that limit? I believe my understanding, and I could have this wrong, was that we had no more than 20 students in a section for academic literacy, for English, and for world studies. Are those limits changing? And we also had some struggles with the 70-30. <clears throat> well, I think first. they're gonna have to take a serious look at those limits, and it may have to be 21, 22. It's highly unlikely um, that we're gonna continue to be able to receive a 70-30 waiver each year. We also received at the end of December um, a letter from the State Board of Education that said that since the time that the waiver approval was given, if there were any changes to the percentages of students, special ed, regular ed, in those classes, that they would have to make reapplication for those specific classes. So the State Board is very serious about ensuring that there is compliance with that. and. Um, uh, Mrs. Schnorr has um, already sent an email to the high school asking them to relook at those classes where there were waiver approvals because in the event that we had any regular education students either move out or transfer out, it's gonna, it's gonna affect the balance and additional data is going to have to be sent to the state board. So if anything, I think they are going to have to take a serious look at looking at 21 and 22 um, for those class sizes to ensure that um, the 70-30 rule is not um, is is not broken. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure, since the, most of the reports, reports were prepared in November and early December, and this number probably came to us after that, I just wanted to make sure the board was not out of sync with what we thought our incoming enrollment was. Mr. Collins. On a somewhat re related topic, I, I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Krizik, Ms. Masterton, Dr. Sullivan, for eliminating one administrative position out of the Director of Research and Assessments Office and in a eventual hope that we eliminate the cohort program because we no longer have the need for it, for going outside the rule, the original guidelines of EPERT, and instead of adding two reading specialists, that you've added four. And I think that goes a long way toward that goal and I just want to say thank you for that. Mrs. Conroy. Um, 
Dr. Sullivan, I wanted to ask you, um, and, and I know this board's make it, made it very clear that we're really concerned about eliminating cohort. I've been hearing some really exciting things that are going on over at Churchville in terms of trying to um, to help these kids. Um, and, and I'm wondering, with all of the exciting things I'm hearing that are going on, do you think that any of these implementations are going to decrease the numbers of kids that will need cohort by the end of this year? I don't know if by the end of this year, actually, uh, the principal at Churchville and I just had this conversation today that we thought it was really going to take probably another year for us to really know. Um, some of the things that was happening at Churchville is happening because we have Title I funds that we're able to provide there. Um, we've hired a math interventionist that we've also been able for part-time at Churchville um, through Title I funds. So we're, we're trying some um, different things. I commend the principal there who's really trying um, some things to really help students. But we think it's probably, just like with, just like with the cohort, it's going to take us <coughs> next year to really know before we have a full year's worth of data and we see how well those kids do as sophomores to really have a good idea of, of um, you know, how well we've implemented the program. Not, quick, not as quickly as we'd like, but we'd like to think that we're doing some of those things so that, um, you know, we don't have as much of a need at the high school. I'd like to thank you and, and Ms. Brown for doing the things that you're doing over there because um, I don't know how much my fellow board members know about it, but I found it really exciting. Ms. Hirsch. Um, I have two more topics and then I am <laughs> done with my, my bulleted questions. But um, the first is just a general question on the special ed. Um, I want to make sure I have an understanding. We're looking to bring some students back into district, right? And we are looking to actually add, if we look at the net change in headcount, we are looking to add five FTE and special ed as well as the 0 .2 services, 0 .4 services at York. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Um, and then my last remaining a, a concern related to the budget is um, the reduction in counseling services for grades six through 12. Uh, I, I really struggle with this. Um, you know, we heard uh, a little bit about it uh, from my own personal experiences. Uh, I laughed because my kids don't like guidance class either. Um, but that does not mean that the kids don't learn things in it and that they don't get really incredibly valuable lessons out of it. And I'm concerned while at the same time we're implementing RTI, we're looking at data and we're putting teams together and some of a kid's academic progress is inhibited by things that are outside the academic arena. And I, I'm very concerned that we are reducing the services to kids at the same time, we're increasing their literacy supports and helping them with the actual instruction piece and how they learn, but we are looking at reducing the resources that are there to support the kids in a social-emotional way and give them really critical skills like note-taking, like how to organize yourself, how to work with agendas. Uh, we don't start those things until middle school. You know, in, in my house, we started those things in fourth and fifth grade, and we don't have any counseling services in the elementary schools at this point. I'm very concerned, and I really can't support making a reduction of two headcount for six to 12. So. I think related to looking at middle school, we would have to look at moving, you know, I think we've mentioned this before, we are one of the, we're the only district that we know that has a guidance class. It has come up in our compliance visit related to the certification issue um, about whether or not our counselors, our teachers certified in the correct um, subject area um, because they should be apparently um, certified in health um, as their content area and that's just, I mean, most counselors our teachers, our teachers at the middle school do have teaching certification, um, but that's a rarity. So we, you know, down the line, they're telling us we're going to have some difficulty with that. We would have to look at moving that curriculum into what is typically in most um, middle schools and in a health class, in some other classes, whether that's you know part of uh, advisory or seminar or some uh, some other classes. So we would absolutely have to look at where we would move some of that curriculum. The, the issue with looking at that would be to not drop counseling services for students 
just looking at the teaching responsibilities. Are you implying that the guidance class itself is going to go away and that those skills are going to be delivered during health class? Most of the curriculum, uh, a lot of the curriculum that we provide in guidance in most districts that is handled through um, health classes, yes. Okay. That is the typical. I, I really cannot support this cut. I, I apologize. I mean, I think that the board has worked diligently to try to better understand all the cuts and all the additions, and I think the administration has been incredibly responsible trying to respond to all of our requests. but. I, I just am, am not ready to say that we should be we should be cutting these services for our kids, um, and I'm not confident. You know, I'll, I'll go back a couple years in time where there was a big hubbub about cutting speech as a class in the high school, and you know, I remember sitting in the audience and the, you know we were assured that those skills were going to be integrated into other courses in the curriculum, and you know, from a personal experience with a senior at York and a freshman at York, I have not seen evidence in my own students in terms of the integration of those skills that we were assured would be integrated into other classes. So my my concern is that these skills are critical skills. Skills. If we're talking about college and career readiness and we're talking about making sure that our students are ready and if we're looking to ramp up their ability to respond to a rigorous curriculum, I think it's short-sighted to exclude specific explicit instruction in the skills that our students need to succeed. Uh, I'm going to ask a, a different question, but one that came up earlier. So we, we had a little bit of conversation about uh, this uh, a couple meetings ago um, when we had to shift around the uh, reductions for the administrative services because some of the recommendations were things that had to be bargained, weren't, weren't things we could control. So the middle school assistant principal was one that came out of that, and uh, a parent came here uh, and spoke to us just about some of the concerns. Can you talk a little bit about you know, how those roles will be continued? Are we expecting the principal of the building to take on some of those um, roles? In our modified presentation this evening, we took that out of the modified presentation. So we said that the schools could not support, could not sustain the loss of an assistant principal at the middle school and or at the high school. So those were taken out. Thank you. Are there any other board questions? Um, I, I'm going to reiterate uh, just uh, some of the comments that were made by board members earlier. I mean, we're drilling down to the to the details of this because we have information that's there to look at. So, you know, just our, our thanks again. I, this is round three, and uh, yeah, I think everyone has has gotten a little bit better as far as the values of our schools. Uh, our school board, the values of our administrator, how we're really delivering um, instruction to our students, what support services we want to be able to provide. Um, so I, I think this is really wonderful work. I know a huge amount of time has gone into it. Um, and, and the fact, you know, as Mr. Uh, Collins, I believe, said earlier and, and has been said in prior meetings, that we are, it's not all about reductions. We're really looking at where the money is best spent. Um, so I, I, I just think that this is a great opportunity as we've spoken to, uh, you know, other, other boards and looked at the experiences of other districts to be able to look at this in a meaningful way and really understand the impact of the decisions that we're making. So uh, again, our, our thanks uh, for all the work that's been done on this. And we will move forward. Um, I think I've got to get back to my agenda here. Um, just a, a quick announcement of, I, I guess, Dr. Krizik, is, is there, are there any final comments that you'd like to make? It, it seems like we're, we're moving forward and with some final uh, things to be refined on this for our next decision-making point. Um, we have a meeting Tuesday, March 8th, uh, 7.30 here, a regular Board of Education workshop meeting, and um, Dr. But, Krizik. But there will be recommendations for you to take action on on March 8th, because you'll need to take the action on March 8th for us to be prepared for all the personnel implications as it relates to the staffing on March 22nd. So we will be coming forth with specific recommendations based on everything that we've heard at the table, based on a majority consensus of conversations at the table. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, again, March 8th will be a decision date and we would expect a recommendation coming substantially as we, we've discussed this evening. Then March 27th, 22nd is uh, the regular Board of Education business meeting. Um, are there any board communications? Um, I, I'm going to just give a, a quick communication. Um, we've had several closed session meetings for the ongoing purpose of our search. Um, and our original timeline was that on March 8th, we hope to come forth with a contract. And I think as we've gotten a little grounding, uh, I think we've, we're making uh, good pro process uh, progress in our search, but it, it's unrealistic to get everything done that needs to be done and to get to a point we think it's too important of a decision to rush through. So just setting reasonable ex expectations uh, really further out in March. So again, I, I would say the process is going well, but the timeline was extraordinarily aggressive and um, we would not expect a recommendation to be coming forth on March 8th, but um, soon thereafter, possibly requiring a separate meeting to be scheduled for that, but um, we'll have more information on that as we can share it. Um, any other board communication? Um, seeing none, I will accept a motion to adjourn. Moved by Ms. Hirsch, is there, uh, seconded by Mr. Carlquist. Um, all in favor? Um, thank you, uh, the meeting is adjourned.